Do you think it takes a long time to make a species? Well, you'd be right. But of course, there's always exceptions. And I want to introduce you to one of those today, the marbled crayfish. Let's look at what makes the marbled crayfish an instant species. How do we know? What is our evidence? That and more coming up. So yeah, we're talking crayfish today, and the one we're going to focus on is this very interesting species, Procambrus virginalis, the marbled crayfish. Now, what makes this uh, particular species interesting is that um, it pretty clearly hasn't been around for a very long period of time. It was only discovered in the German pet trade uh, samples in 1995. And believe it or not, there's a lot of people interested in crayfish. And crayfish are traded around the world. There's hundreds of species. And uh, had this particular uh, species existed long before 1995, it surely would have been noticed by somebody. Uh, and so where did it come from? If it suddenly appeared, how could it have come into being uh, only in 1995 or very soon before that? So here's some interesting little tidbits about uh, Procambrus uh, uh, virginalis. All the members of the species are female. And you say, well, they're all female, so how do they reproduce? Well, they don't reproduce by males and females getting together and having sexual recombination, right? They produce by a process called parthenogenesis, and we'll, I'll show you what that is in a moment. They are most similar to another species of crayfish called Procambrus phallix, and that particular species is found in the southwestern U.S. in the tributaries of the Satia uh, river in Georgia and Florida. So a, a crayfish that has a rather limited uh, range. Now, what's interesting then, of course, is you're like, well, okay, so this was discovered in the German pet trade, but its closest, I guess you could say its closest relative, right, is found in just a few tributaries of one river in Georgia and Florida. Um, where exactly did this species come from and how did it come to be? That's what we're here to answer. So here's our lovely specimen of the marbled crayfish. And uh, the marbled crayfish is actually a fairly large crayfish, and that owes to its distinctive genome, which we'll get to uh, in a little bit as we look at some of the scientific evidence uh, for the origins of this particular crayfish. Um, but I'm sure what you're really wondering at first is like, okay, so where did this crayfish come from? Uh, how did it come into being and how is it related to this other crayfish? And I just told you they're all females. So how exactly does that work? So I've, I've drawn this out. What, what would usually happen in any particular crayfish uh, species that you want to pick out is that you would have two individuals, right? You'd have a male and a female crayfish. Uh, in this case, uh, we have Procambrus phallix. Uh, and that, that species has 184 chromosomes. So you're starting with two crayfish, each with 184 chromosomes. Now, in order to reproduce, uh, two diploid organisms, you and I are diploid organisms, we have two copies of our genome. Um, we have to go through a process of dividing our genomes, or, or our two genomes, into uh, single sets of genomes. And that process is called meiosis. This probably brings back bad memories of biology from high school, right? Dividing the genetic material in half. Uh, and so if we take our 184 chromosomes and we divide them in half, we're gonna end up making an egg and a sperm, the sex cells, each of which has one set of the genome rather than two. In this case, it's gonna be 92 chromosomes. Now, in your case, and I assume that everyone watching is a human being, uh, you have 46 chromosomes as a diploid organism, so your double set of chromosomes, your double set of genomes. And then when you make sex cells, you divide that in half and you end up with 23 chromosomes in, in either the egg or the sperm. So here we have an organism that has a whole lot more chromosomes than human beings have. Uh, and so 92 chromosomes in the egg and the sperm. And then what do egg and sperm do? Well, they get together and when they fuse together, uh, the process called syngamy, or you think of fertilization, it forms the first, right, cell of the next generation. 
uh, and that's going to fuse the two nuclei that have the 92 chromosomes together into one cell that now has 184 chromosomes, which would be the same number of chromosomes that the parents of this particular individual cell had. And then what does that cell do? That cell is going to start to divide and grow, and it's going to develop into an adult organism, which all the cells in that particular organism are, have 184 chromosomes. Well, except for the sex cells, which will have undergone meiosis and will make 92 chromosomes again, starting the process once again. So this goes on and on and on. And any species, if it wants to continue its existence, is going to need to go through this process, right, of making new offspring since there aren't any organisms that are immortal uh, out there. And so I'm also depicting here the fact that uh, this organism is a diploid, so let me get that term in here, right? A diploid organism just means two ploidy. Ploidy is your genome. You have two copies of your genome, which means you have two copies of every chromosome. And on each copy of your chromosome, you might have, a, you would have a copy of a gene. So you have two copies of all of your genes, right? You have a gene for making uh, insulin and, uh, and crayfish have that too. Um, so you have a gene for making insulin and uh, you have two copies of that gene. And those two copies may be identical to each other because both your mom and dad gave you the same copy of that gene. Or they might have slight differences between them, in which case we call those different alleles because you have two different forms uh, of that particular gene. And so I'm depicting this here as you have a orange copy of chromosome, a green copy of chromosome, one came from your mom, one came from your dad, right? And you are a combo right, of your mom and your dad, those two gene copies have to sort of work it out amongst themselves, you know, this is the way the genes are going to function in me. Uh, and then I'm going to take one copy of those genes and I'm going to give them to my kids. All right, so this is the normal way a species propagates itself over time. Now, where did this new crayfish come from? So if this new crayfish, say we go back to 1980. I don't think this crayfish and the scientists who have studied this don't think that this crayfish species existed in 1980 at all. If it didn't exist at all, there's only two possible origins for it, right? It either had to have derived itself from another present species, making itself different enough that we recognize it as a new species, a different species from any other species alive. But it finds its origins in a common ancestor with some species alive on Earth today. Or it just popped into existence, right? Uh, and it's brand new, and it doesn't share any relationship with any other species on Earth. Here's a hypothesis, and this is the working hypothesis that scientists who have been researching this particular crayfish are working under, and I'm going to show you some data that supports that particular hypothesis. Uh, for the origin of this particular species of the marble crayfish. So we're going to start out with, again, two crayfish, a male and a female. They each have 184 chromosomes, and we're going to say this is uh, Procambus phallax, right, this other species that lives in uh, Georgia and Florida. And each of those then undergoes meiosis, right, because they're going to reproduce. They're going to make sex cells. So they have to divide their chromosomes into one set of chromosomes instead of having two. Ah, mistake is made though, all right? So here's what could happen, and this does happen, we know this happens in organisms and we see it, is meiosis can mess up, right? The meiotic process might go awry, uh, and in this case, meiosis doesn't occur, and it simply takes all the chromosomes, and or what might happen is it actually takes one cell, tries to divide it into two cells to make, say, two eggs. One egg gets zero chromosomes, and the other gets all 184 chromosomes. So there's a, there's a problem in the separation process of separating the two sets of chromosomes, and they all just get into one egg. So now you have an egg that is representative of the adult cells, not of sex cells, but it's in a sex cell. And then you have the other, or the, 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 the partner, uh, here we have the male making sperm, and it's doing meiosis the right way and it's producing sperm that have 92 chromosomes. So now these two animals meet each other and the sperm is shared with the eggs on the female. One of those sperm 
fertilizes that particular egg. And so you add the 92 chromosomes to the 184 chromosomes to make a cell that has 276 chromosomes. Um, that cell then, and I, and I would say normally this would be a, uh, a lethal situation. Genetically, there's an imbalance here. Um, there's going to be probably be a problem as the cell begins to divide into multiple cells, and it's going to create a spontaneous abortion. Um, uh, the, the, the fetus isn't going to survive. But in rare situations, the genes might be able to work it out, work the situation out. All right, we have a different number or different number of copies of genes, and yet we still try to we still figure out how to make a working living organism out of this. The cells divide and grow into an adult, and that adult has some different characteristics than the two parents do. Now you might be saying to yourself, "But they have all the same genes, right? They have all the same genes that the parents the parent species has." Uh, you simply have an extra copy of all the genes. They are now what we call a triploid. This is a triploid organism. Triploid means you have three copies of the genome instead of two. Um, you're, you may be familiar with a triploid situation. Actually, you're, you're, in, you're familiar with a triplet chromosome situation. Uh, in human beings, you can have this kind of mistake, right? Each person makes uh, has 46 chromosomes. We make uh, sex cells that have 23 chromosomes. But once in a while, there's a mistake made where the 21st chromosome doesn't separate and it goes into one egg or one sperm instead of uh, dividing into two sperm or two eggs. And when that occurs, you can end up with two copies of the 21st chromosome in one cell, and then maybe the other, the, the sperm or the egg that it's going to join with only has one. You put, the th you put the, those together and you end up with three copies of the 21st chromosome, and it's called trisomy 21, uh, meaning three chromosomes of the 21st chromosome. And the common name for that is Down syndrome. Now, if you look at somebody who has the Down syndrome condition, they have uh, some characteristic differences from the average human being that has the normal number of chromosomes at that particular position, right? There's a whole set of morphological or physical traits that are different, and there's also um, other physiological um, and uh, mental traits that are different. And so you, it's, it's apparent that just having one extra copy of a chromosome changes the developmental process in terms of how those genes are being turned off and turned on and how much of their products are being produced because now you have three copies instead of two and that changes the developmental process resulting in an, in, an individual in the end that has characteristics that are not like either of the parents. And that's what's happening right here with this triploid or three copied Chrome, three copy genome of this particular crayfish. Now, this isn't just copying one set. This isn't just copying one chromosome and making three out of it. This is all the sets, right? So you have you have 92 extra chromosomes in this particular crayfish, and yet it makes a viable uh, uh, crayfish. Now, when I say viable, I don't mean that this crayfish can reproduce with uh, any of its uh, neighbors, because because it has 276, it creates some problems itself doing meiosis. Meiosis has difficulty dividing three into sets of ones, uh, and so it's going to create more mutations, chromosomal mutations. Um, we know through experiments that have been done with the marbled crayfish, we know that uh, that the parent species, the the proposed parent species, as I'm showing here. Uh, attempts to mate with marbled uh, crayfish, but they're completely unsuccessful. So when their sperm or their eggs are mixed, well, actually, it's just going to be sperm because all marbled crayfish are female. If a male um, Procambrus phallax tries to mate with a marbled crayfish, they're unsuccessful. The sperm can't enter and successfully fertilize the eggs of the marbled crayfish. But the marble crayfish does produce eggs. And what eggs does it produce? Well, it produces eggs that have 276 chromosomes. So they just bypass the step of doing meiosis. 
they simply form cells that act as eggs, but they never go through the process of doing meiosis. So they don't try to divide 276 into half of that, which would be an issue anyway, because that would be an odd number and chromosomes always come in even numbers and diploids. Um, and so what happens here is that they just don't uh, do meiosis. So that's another genetic difference between marble crayfish and all other crayfish. They don't do meiosis. They produce 276 chromosomed eggs and they don't need to be fertilized. The eggs can be laid and then they can start to divide and they start to divide without ever being fertilized. Um, and so they aren't truly gametes because the definition of gametes or sperm and egg are gametes is that they are cells that need to fuse and join before they can begin the process of dividing and forming a new organism. In this case, they don't require any fusion. It just requires the eggs mature. They get to a point where they start that something triggers them to start dividing. They divide and grow into another crayfish. And because this first crayfish was female, they grow and divide into another female crayfish. That crayfish then produces more eggs that produce more crayfish that are all female. And so they are a clonal organism because it can only do asexual reproduction rather than sexual reproduction. But there's hundreds of thousands of species on Earth that are asexual, uh, that, are, that are true species. So this is in really every sense uh, 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 of, of thinking about it, this is a different species now. It's an instant species. The moment that this particular uh, 276 celled zygote first cell formed and began to grow successfully into a crayfish, that was the very first member of this species. Now, how many members of this species are there? There are millions and millions of this particular species on Earth now. Uh, they're found in um, they're found in uh, people's collections, all right, in, inside of aquaria, uh, all over the world. They had already spread uh, through aquaria. They were very popular uh, after 1995. They have different features. They grow very large. Uh, they grow very quickly, and they have a lot of eggs, which means they have a lot of offspring. So there's a lot of things to share. The problem with that too was. They reproduce so quickly that people start to dump them outside and then they have escaped into the wild. And so they're found in great abundance in Madagascar. They're in almost every country in Europe. They're in Japan, they're in Taiwan, uh, I think Canada. Uh, so far, they're not found in the wild in the United States. Uh, and there's lots of restrictions about letting these loose because we don't want them in the wild because what we're seeing is that uh, the marble crayfish is very competitive in the wild. Uh, com uh, competitive, I mean, against all the other crayfish species. In many places, they're out competing the local species and they are starting to dominate and take over in various environments. So let's look at, uh, all right, so that was, that's, I'll say that, that that was the hypothesis for the origin of the marble crayfish. So when it was first discovered, and then people looked at the chromosomes. So there are ways to look at how many chromosomes uh, cells have. They noticed that, yeah, they have a third more chromosomes than other crayfish have. And so it was easy to imagine a scenario where they're autopolyploids. Uh, that's the word in this paper here. Auto means doing it themselves. Polyploid means doubling a copy of chromosomes. And then they uh, reproduce by parthenogenesis. So here's a paper from 2015. Remember, this was discovered in 1995. Um, there's been a, a quite a bit of research done on these and recently a lot more genetic work to try to get down into the details of ex just what they are and how they're related to other organisms. And then also there's just a lot of interest in what will happen to this particular species. We're, we're actually watching a brand new species that has come into existence. We didn't see the very moment it came into existence, but we know we're really close to that moment. And now we're watching this species spread across the earth <laughs> and we're able to sample the species in different places at different times and watch how it mutates, watch how it adapts to different environments uh, and test a variety of different kinds of molecular biology um, um, things that are going on, right? We have to test how is natural selection acting on this? How are mutations affecting uh, this particular species? Um, but we'll get to some of those questions a little bit later here. 
So here's a paper, The Marbled Crayfish as a Paradigm for Saltational Speciation. Uh, now, saltational means uh, immediate or quick speciation versus a long, drawn-out process by which populations are separated. Allele frequencies change over time as organisms adapt slowly to new environments and eventually accumulate enough changes that we would identify those things as different species. Here we have one day there's one, two members of one species. The next day there's a brand new species. And it's a new species because it can't, it can't back cross to its parents. Uh, it's isolated on its own and it can only make more of itself. Uh, and it can't share any of its genetics with any other species. So this paper looks at some of the differences between the marble crayfish and other potential uh, relatives, which I've already mentioned the main one, which is Procambus phallus. This is just, a, I'll show you just a couple images from this paper. Just to, uh, for, this shows you that these two crayfish are pretty similar, but they're not identical. Uh, and so over here we have the, um, the marble crayfish, and over here we have its closest relative, we think, that is its parents. And there are slight differences in the morphology, the external appearance of these things. They have slightly different coloration. You see their eyes are, they actually have a slightly different eye color. Um, and if you add it up, there's dozens and dozens of traits that are um, consistently different. Uh, and even though they have very similar, similar genetics, but not the same, they're expressing their genes in different ways, probably because they have these three copies of their genome. So one place where you can see a dramatic difference uh, between these two species is you can see the carapace length for the parent species, the ancestral species, we could say. Uh, the average was uh, less than 20 millimeters in length, whereas uh, the marble crayfish is uh, 40 millimeters in length, so over four centimeters in, in length uh, at a particular stage uh, in its development. But then look at the number of eggs produced, right? This, I think, uh, this number was, I think the average was 41 for the ancestral species, but um, these, tet uh, these, I'm sorry, these triploid species uh, were making on average 300 eggs. So, that might explain a little bit of why this particular species is doing so well because uh, if you have its parent around and its parent is only in Georgia and Florida so it's competing against other species in other places like Europe but those species are kind of similar in the sense that they make fewer eggs um, this thing makes a lot of eggs now it does have a huge range from a few to a lot uh, depending on the location it's in but nonetheless, the average is an enormous amount of eggs. Now, if you produce a lot of eggs and every single one can just grow into another female adult, uh, each of which can produce a whole lot of eggs again, and these grow very quickly as well, um, then you can see how they could just outcompete their neighbors by simply making a lot of crayfish at a much faster pace uh, than other species can. And that's one way you can outcompete your neighbor, even if even if maybe you're not quite as good at getting food or quite as, you know, you might not be quite as fit in many other aspects for that environment. But if you're just out reproducing them, you can shove them into uh, extinction uh, simply by outnumbering them. Another paper, and this is the, uh, a group that actually sequenced the entire genome. And once they had the entire genome, now they have all the chromosomes and they can look at the sequences and they can see now that what's actually going on here. So clonal genome evolution and rapid invasive spread of the marble crayfish. Yes, it is rapidly spreading and invading into many new environments. There's actually a lot of concern about and that's That's why many countries have banned marble crayfish. Uh, even from the aquaria, the aquaria uh, industry. But certainly, if you have one in an aquarium, you're going to be hit with a huge fine if you're ever seen putting this out into the wild uh, because there's a concern that these, we don't really know how competitive these particular crayfish are going to be over the long run, uh, and they might displace uh, all of our other natural or native uh, crayfish. So just want to point out a couple things about this species from these genetic studies and in particular this genome study. 
Um, one is, and I, I don't want to, I'm not going to explain all these figures, but this particular figure right here, uh, what this is telling us is variant distribution. It's saying that if you have variant distribution of like around 0.5, it means that you have a lot of different variants and most of the individuals that are looked at are heterozygous. In other words, there's a lot of heterozygotes. A heterozygote is when you have one copy of a gene and the other copy of the gene you have is different from it. So like being, you know, if you have if your parent has a brown eyes, another parent has blue eyes, you might have a brown eye gene and a blue eye gene. The brown eye gene is kind of winning out until you have brown eyes, but nonetheless, you genetically are heterozygous. You have variation in you. Um, the parent species isn't terribly variable. In fact, there's another related species that isn't very variable either. So you don't see a lot of, lot of variation within individuals. Um, but in this new species, there is a tremendous amount of variation there. Um, a little bit of that is because you have the three different chromosomes, but it turns out the two chromosomes are fairly fairly similar to each other, and the other chromosome is very different uh, than the other one. And so it's as if what happened was you had two different individuals from two different ends of the spectrum of the uh, of this particular species, because we think that this species, both parents, came from this other species. But to get that much variation into this new species, it must have been like two of the most different types or versions of that other species that then contributed to the chromosomes in this new species. And because now all they do is can clone it, um, they don't get rid of that variation. They just maintain that variation over time. Um, and so this species is highly variable. You might, you might be wondering like, well, so how did you end up with two very different uh, members of, of um, Procambus phallus, uh, which is only found in a small area of Georgia and Florida. Well, that particular species is found widespread throughout the world in aquaria. And the, the prevailing theory right now is that all of this, what I'm explaining, didn't actually happen in the wild. All right, so this event that created this new species, this new individual that becomes a new species, probably happened inside of somebody's aquaria somewhere. Uh, and that aquaria could have been anywhere, even though it was first discovered in Germany. Um, these animals have been spread, you know, have been passed around. So if you think about these animals being passed around, somebody collected one in Georgia at some point maybe another one in Georgia, and it got sent somewhere in the world. And then so you have these different individuals being moved around. Um, you can have really different variants. And then somebody had two different ones of these in the same aquaria, and those are the two that mated with each other and ended up forming this mixture, right, this hybrid between the two opposite spectrums of variation within that particular species. Now, this middle figure here is just showing the relationships of the marbled crayfish with uh, the other two species of crayfish that are the most similar morphologically. One was uh, Procambus phallus and the other one is Procambus uh, alaria. Um, and the length of the line represents the amount of genetic difference so the, or the genetic distance uh, between those species. And so uh, it has been thought that maybe this one contributed something uh, to the new marble crayfish. But now that they've sequenced the entire genome and compared all the genes and the sequences, um, they realize that all the sequences look like they have come from and are most similar to this particular species. Um, but they're not the same, right? They're different. So they have, uh, as a total package, being one individual, it's a new combination of those of that other species that then has had its own mutations over the last 20, 30 years, right? So it has accumulated its own variants, which will be unique to itself. And that is part of what's that's part of what's creating this uh, this distance, genetic distance between this new species and the one that existed before it or its ancestor. This figure up here, let me get rid of my ink. And uh, this figure up here is showing 
um, sequences that were of DNA sequences of long regions of the genome from multiple different samples of the marbled crayfish from different locations around the world. So we have, what do we have here? We've got uh, some pet shop, pet shop in 2003. Uh, we've got several Madagascarin samples. Uh, and we also have uh, some other samples that are, yeah, wild caught in different, like this is in Heidelberg, uh, Germany. And these lines represent, again, genetic distance. So that would be an accumulation of mutations, right? The, the, the marble crayfish, it originally started, who knows, I don't know where we, let's just say it started here, right? That's your first one in 1991 or 92 or 94 or whenever it happened, sometime before 1995, but probably not too long before that because otherwise it would have been noticed by somebody in the crayfish industry. And so it appears, right? And when it appeared, it had a particular DNA sequence, right, on each of those three chromosomes. But then every time it copies itself, it makes some mistakes. And so it makes some mistakes, and as it makes mistakes, they become, the descendants, the children, become more different from one another. And there's no way for them to, like, recombine, right? Because they are asexual, so they're just making more copies. And as they do, they just keep getting more different from each other. So what happens is they just end up radiating out from the origin point into different branches. Now, all of these you would still consider to be all the same species because despite their, some of their genetic difference, and this is actually isn't very much, if I were to draw it down here, it'd be like, oh, just little tiny bits of change compared to this other species, which has been around for who knows how long and has developed a lot more differences. That's why there's more genetic morphological differences within the species. Um, whereas... A uh, marble crayfish from Madagascar or someone's uh, aquarium here in the United States or caught wild in Japan, uh, you probably couldn't tell the difference between them. They're, they're so similar still. Um, but eventually they will become more different, right? I mean, that's, that is the inevitable outcome of being an asexual organism is that you will accumulate mutations. And as you accumulate mutations, you're going to become different than the other descendants because there's no way that you can share your differences with them to become more similar again. And so they will just continue to become more and more different. And so different marble crayfish in different countries will probably end up accumulating differences and becoming more different over time. And eventually, I would say in the fairly distant future, some of those lineages will themselves become so different that they will be different species. Um, so they're not going to be instant species. They're going to be slowly and gradually changing organisms that become different species over time. And so we've suggested that we had uh, two individuals of the ancestral species, one of which made a mistake in meiosis, could have been the male, could have been the female, and you ended up with a 276 chromosome marble crayfish. Now that crayfish is spreading across the globe, uh, through the pet trade, and then now it's escaped into the wild in multiple locations, and there are millions upon millions of them uh, in some locations. All right? They can produce so many eggs, and they can expand very, very quickly. Uh, it's thought that they can do that because being triploid, um, uh, tetraploids are fairly common in plants. Tetraploid would be having four copies of all your chromosomes or maybe hexaploid, meaning you have six copies of all your chromosomes. So if you think about watermelon and a lot of the various types of cucumbers, and a lot of different fruits you eat that, that can grow very large, almost all of them are tetraploids or quadru sorry, yeah, tetraploids or quadruploids, hexaploids. They have multiple copies of their genome. And in plants, when you copy, when you have mistakes like this that duplicate chromosomes, uh, in some cases, plant biologists have purposely done it. There are ways to force organisms to double their chromosomes. Um, then what usually happens is you grow larger fruits and the organisms grow larger in general. Um, that's not always to the benefit of the organism, right? It's not, that, that's not always a good thing to be able to grow really fast or grow really large. Um, it takes a lot of resource to do that. You have to do it quickly. Um, however, it's just that's an observation 
of, from many different organisms that uh, doubling chromosome numbers usually increases size and increases uh, reproductive uh, capacity. Uh, and that's clearly what's happening here with this particular crayfish. So now the big question is, and this is why there's a lot of academic interest in marble crayfish, but there's also interest from a public policy ecological standpoint in terms of what are they going to do to all the other crayfish in the world? Um, the big question is, what is their future, right? What does the future hold for this species? Well, interestingly, in, well, I'll say it, in evolutionary theory, there's two things you have to consider here. Uh, and this is, these ideas have been developed by watching and looking at many, many other species. And so these would be two predictions uh, for what could happen with the species. Short term, there is, does seem to be a short term advantage over other species that are similar to itself because it can copy without a mate and it can produce a larger number of offspring than its competitors. And so when I, what do I mean by it can copy itself without a mate? Um, if you are a, a, a sexual species and you have males and females, right, then half of your offspring are probably going to be males. The males can't produce direct offspring, right? They're not the ones producing the eggs. And so only half of the population actually produces offspring. The other half of the population is just responsible for being, well, I mean, they're just sperm delivery devices, right? They're delivery devices for delivering a portion of the genome to the next generation. Uh, and so it takes two for every batch of eggs. Now, look what's happening with this parthenogenic species. Every single one of them is a female. So it means every member of the population is capable of producing a whole bunch of offspring. And every single one of those females is capable of producing twice or five times as many offspring as any female from the other species that it's, it's surrounded by. So that means it has a huge advantage in terms of producing offspring. It can devote all its energy to that uh, without having to having males around. There's another advantage to not having to uh, have males around is that you don't have to find a male. So let's say you're in a location where there is not very many individuals, right? And you're a female. Before you can have offspring, you have to fertilize your eggs, which means you're going to have to go out and search for a male or hope that the male finds you. And there are times where maybe that doesn't happen, in which case your, your eggs don't get fertilized and they go to waste. Uh, and so it, it, it can be a, a daunting prospect to find a mate. This is true for any mating species, right? That's a challenge uh, for them is to find a mate. Uh, finding a mate can require a lot of energy. If you're expending a lot of energy finding a mate, then you're going to spend less energy putting that into making eggs. So these females... They don't have to worry about it. They don't have to go hunt for a mate. They simply make the eggs and they can devote all their energy to it and they can make a huge number of eggs. And so in the short term, asexual reproduction almost always has an advantage over sexual reproduction. So this is always a, a big question that, that people have, especially about like evolutionary biology is like the origins of sex and why there's sex because there's obvious advantages to asexuality. Uh, in terms of the success of organisms in the short term. Now, but I keep using the word short term. So that's your hint that possibly this isn't a good strategy for the long-term prospects of any particular species. So there is a long-term disadvantage for an asexual species, all right? So the long-term disadvantage over other species because it can't remove the negative alleles by recombination. Uh, and so what I mean by that is, if you have a mutation in one of your offspring, uh, what happens in diploid organisms that can mate with each other is uh, you could have a, a, a negative mutation, but then when you cross with another member of the species, right, and form offspring, some of those offspring won't get that particular negative allele. They'll only get the other allele. And so it's kind of, you can think of it as you keep booting out some of your negative alleles this way and you produce offspring that then are joining together the other the other side of the other side of the coin here is you can have an offspring that has a positive allele 
you know, some new change that makes it better adapted for its environment. And you can have another individual that has a different positive benefit, you know, a new beneficial allele. And, uh, but in an asexual species, you're never going to get the two together in the same organism, right? Because you can never like say, hey, I'm going to give you this and I'll give you this chromosome. You can put them together and you have a new offspring that has both these beneficial um, genes and that's going to make it even you even better. In other words, it helps you adapt to your environment more quickly if you can recombine with lots of other organisms that have different variants. And you can make new packages of variants, some of which might be much better for future environments. An asexual organism simply makes lots of variants and... Each of them might have a beneficial variant, but they can't ever combine them into a package of one organism, which would have even more benefit. Uh, and so all you're relying on is they have to incrementally add beneficial mutations. And at the same time, it's harder for them to get rid of all the negative mutations they have. So what can happen is you can build up what's called something like a, a what's called mutational load. You can build up mutations in a particular lineage to the point where maybe they now have a disadvantage over other species in the area and they'll get outcompeted. And so then the species begins to, you could call it decline or decay, right? Um, that species no longer is as competitive and fit for the environment. Now, they do have some ways to overcome this long term. One is by producing so many offspring. Ones that have a bunch of negative mutations is like, well, I've just produced so many offspring. Like if a few of them die, that's fine because that removes those negative mutations. A few of these other individuals didn't have those mutations and they will continue on. They'll make a new, a new branch, which will then replace all those other members of the species. And you can just kind of keep on adding on new variants uh, and uh, possibly continue your existence that way. Um, but it, it's, it, it can be a tough road. But if you're extremely numerous, which this species may become very numerous, this, this species could easily become a number in the hundreds of millions, if not billions at some point. Uh, at that point, um, there's always going to be a few individuals that have the right individual uh, mutations that allow it to persist into the future and become the new strains and lines that then make lots of new copies and replace the, the previous lineages. So it'll continue to, I guess you could say, continue to evolve over time. Now, what does that kind of remind you of? Uh, you know, an asexual organism, all right, that can't recombine with anything. And so it's, it, all it's doing is accumulating mutations over time and producing new strains or new variants over time. And then how does it persist over time? Not every variant survives throughout all of time, right? Not every individual is going to have offspring that have offspring that have offspring that have offspring. What's going to happen is some offspring will be more competitive and have an advantage over other offspring. And those will then outcompete offspring from the same species, pushing them out of existence getting rid of those variants, and then that particular variant will take over and be the next, you know, dominant lineage, which will then spread through various geographical regions and so forth, right? Doesn't that sound a whole lot like coronavirus, right? So you have, you have a viral strain that might have started as a single version with just the right magic combination in order to invade a new host. Then it begins to copy itself. It makes mistakes. And as it passes itself from one host to another, some of those mistakes give that particular strain a new, a new advantage. Uh, and it could be one of several different advantages. It could, you know, could spread more rapidly. It could reproduce itself more quickly. Uh, it could be less virulent and so it stays in the host longer, allowing it to spread more and so forth, right? Whatever it is, eventually one strain will find a competitive advantage over another. And that's what we've seen. Right. The original version of SARS-CoV-2 doesn't exist anymore. It's been outcompeted by its descendants. Uh, and then some of those descendants became very, very, very common. Right. They, they pushed out and outcompeted out a bunch of other lines or lineages. So the alpha lineage outcompeted everybody else. Then the delta lineage outcompeted everyone else that was present. 
But then there was another little lineage on the side that had a whole bunch of mutations that gave it a benefit over Delta, and it has pushed Delta virtually to out of existence. However, the virus itself still exists, right? If you want to think of that as a species, it continues its existence, but in ever-changing different forms. Um, and that's what we're going to see with this grayfish is we're going to see lots and lots of different lineages, some of which may become more competitively, uh, have a better competitive advantage than others. And then we'll see sort of like the spread of that. So just like we have been able to trace from the very beginning with SARS-CoV-2, we've been able to like basically watch the evolution of the virus and see how different lineages of this asexual organism replace themselves and, and, and change and shift across the earth we're tracking this crayfish and we're basically watching the evolution of the species and uh, by watching it very 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 carefully we're going to be able to study things like what advantages do different genes provide in different environments and how did these you know if you had different mutations how does that affect its ability to survive in an environment and compete with its neighbors and so forth how bad are the number of mutations that they have? Do mutations eventually cause them to uh, become less fit over time? That's a, that's a huge question. Like how much will that suppress the species later on in time? And how long will that take to get to the point where maybe that's a problem? Or will it never be a problem because there'll always be one or, few, one or two little individual new strains that sort of avoid those mutations and then kick off another series or explosion of population growth um, creating a new lineage of crayfish uh, over time? Or will it divide into like maybe two or three different subspecies that are in different parts of the world that become isolated from one another, right? So the patterns of how this crayfish expands into new environments and how it competes with other organisms are going to be really intriguing to watch. And this is why so much work has been done on this. They've sequenced the genome. We've gotten all kinds of ways of getting quick data from this people are collecting these samples from all over the world it's kind of like a little mini network like they're studying a virus uh and and it's going to be you know people are trying to turn this into kind of like a, another model organism where we can test ideas about how organisms change and the more times we can track different species that uh, have different interesting traits um, the more we get to understand how organisms actually do adapt and change in their environments over time. All right, so that's the story of, the, of an instant species creation. Uh, but it's really the aftermath of the instant species creation that is, that is the intriguing part. And it's, the, it's the story to continue to follow. Uh, and I look forward to sort of watching the data unfold over the next few years and, and see what happens to the marbled crayfish. Um, it's really great because we get to make predictions, right? We get to, we have a bunch of hypotheses, uh, which I didn't share all the different hypotheses with you, but there are a bunch of hypotheses about like what could happen to this species. Uh, and so now we can test those hypotheses by actually following the species and seeing what happens to it. Just like there are predictions about uh, coronavirus and what will happen to coronavirus. And we're watching that species evolve right in front of our eyes. All right, so that's the story of marbled crayfish. Hope you enjoyed that. Uh, my name's uh, Joel Duff, and I, uh, I talk on a number of different topics, including science and faith issues, but this was more of a, like, a pure science talk. And so if you subscribe to my YouTube channel, there's, uh, there'll be a wide variety of different topics discussed there. But if you enjoyed this video, there'll be more like it. So hit the subscribe button, and uh, we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.